Hannah Kawas is a Palestinian born in Bethlehem, Palestine, and is a writer and activist working for Palestinian national and human rights, and is the chairperson of the Canada-Palestine Association and co-host of The Voice of Palestine. I think uh, really um, it's important, uh, I wanna uh, talk about an incident that Edward Said did after the liberation of South Lebanon. He visited uh, uh, South Lebanon, or Lebanon in general, uh, in July uh, 2000, just after the, the uh, resistance in South Lebanon uh, kicked out the Israelis from South Lebanon. And he went to the borders in the south, and he threw stones. He, his, by the way, his, uh, his son was with him. So they were trying to show who throws stone uh, uh, harder than the other, you know, at the, at the fence there against Israel. And then this story came out in the American media. And basically, you know, oh, this, is, uh, this guy is a terrorist, you know. Actually, <laughs> actually, you know, journalist Edward Alexander labeled Saeed as, quote, the professor of terror. You know, just show you how, uh, although Saeed said, you know, we were doing that, and as a symbolic gesture that we got rid of the occupation of South Lebanon, which is uh, what he said. Uh, something else he said, I don't know where I read it, uh, but he said he, he met with Nasrallah, the leader of Hezbollah, and he was surprised, he said, he never met a person like this Nasrallah, although Nasrallah is, you know, I mean, uh, his, uh, his meetings should be uh, very secret and, you know, like uh, Arafat used to come after half an hour or an hour <laughs> to the meeting. But he said he never met a Arab leader that was on time. Nasrallah was on time. <laughs> Nasrallah was on time. <laughs> As during his set. <laughs> and he's talking about leaders, not the common people. <laughs> so, um, you know, um, uh, Said was visionary. He also, uh, you know, just before he died, he took a very critical position on the Iraq war. And he was saying basically, uh, which came true, maybe I, I read uh, what he said. Um, he said, uh, the U.S. war against Iraq was politically ill-conceived military enterprise. I don't think the planning for the post-Saddam, post-war period in Iraq is very sophisticated and is, there is little of it. So, which proved, you know, after all these years, uh, he was right, he, he was visionary, you know. Uh, uh, the, the Americans, instead of controlling the oil and is, instead of advancing uh, the situation in Iraq, now Iraq is against America in general. Uh, the the, the um, uh, Iraqi parliament is in the process of asking all foreign forces, including the Americans, to leave uh, Iraq. And uh, he, they, according to them, they want to uh, fight Al-Qaeda, according to the Americans, Al-Qaeda and Iran influence in, in Iraq. And what they did, they brought Al-Qaeda, the ISIS, and they brought the Iranian influence to Iraq. And uh, our friend uh, Trump said, we spent seven trillion dollars on Iraq and we got nothing out of it, you know? So that's what he said, you know? It shows you how, how ill-conceived this planning was, and this is what uh, um, Edward Said said. Um, the, he wrote an article I'm going to move to his position on the Palestinian question and specifically on the Oslo Accord. He wrote an article in October uh, uh, 1993, just a month after the Oslo process or the, the signing of the Oslo process. And he was very clear in it. He, uh, you know, was prophetic in, as, as usual in many ways. And I'll, I'll talk a, a bit about it. Um, about this specific article. It's called The Morning After, uh, the article. People could find it online uh, for more details. It's quite valuable. And he uh, basically said that this 
uh, Oslo process gave the Palestinian nothing. And he quoted even, he quoted, uh, James Baker conceded that it gave the Palestinian people nothing. And also he quoted uh, the Israeli dove, Amos Oz, reportedly put it in the course, and this is, I'm, I'm quoting from the morning after uh, that Edward Said uh, wrote. He, he said, uh, Amos Oz reportedly put it in the course of a BBC, BBC interview, and quote, this is the second biggest victory in the history of Zionism. <laughs> that, that's the Oslo Accord, you know. So uh, actually also uh, to just, uh, uh, he was, uh, uh, you know, uh, friends with Israel Shahak. Actually, he wrote an, an introduction to uh, Israel Shahak book. But uh, we in the Voice of Palestine interviewed Israel Shahak a month after the the morning after. Uh, this the morning after was in October. We interviewed Israel Shahak on on Voice of Palestine in November 1993, and the the interview wasn't about the Oslo process, you know. It was about Israel uh, militarism and its sales of, of military equipment all over the world, which Israel Shahak was an expert on. So we interviewed him on that, and I couldn't resist myself. At the end of the interview, I asked him, you know, the Oslo process was just two months ago. What do you think of the Oslo process? And he gave me the exact words that uh, James Baker Told, uh, said uh, about the uh, Oslo process, he said nothing. It gave the Palestinian nothing. And, uh, you know, and he explained why, because he said it's going to be, um, they expect the PLO to become the village league. The village league were collaborators that Israel recruited after the 67 war. They, they armed them, and they used to be the Mukhtars and the, you know, the, the so-called uh, leaders of the, of the uh, tribes uh, around Palestine. And they gave them to keep, uh, basically. And this is actually what happened. This is, uh, they were prophetic, both of them, that uh, this is what the, they want from the uh, Palestinian Authority to become collaborators uh, and to enforce uh, the, the Israeli security, basically. Also, he said, he predicted that the, uh, uh, the um, Oslo process or the agreement, uh, uh, he said, but on the matter of how or what specific mechanism to get from an interim status to a later one, the document is purposefully silent. Does this mean ominously that the interim stage may be the final one? Which is, that's exactly what happened. And he wrote it just before even uh, the second intifada came into uh, the picture in 2000. Um, and he said the PLO will thus become Israel's enforcer, an unhappy prospect for most Palestinian, interestingly. The ANC has consistently refused to supply the South African government with police officials until after power is shared, precisely in order to avoid appearing as the white government enforcer. And uh, Mr. Abbas <laughs> is really an enforcer. Nobody could argue that. The, P the PNC or, and the, um, the, um, uh, the Palestinian uh, Council many times uh, took decisions to stop the collaboration, the military, the intelligence uh, cooperation with Israel, and he's not implementing it. They took many decisions. The, the PLO uh, structure, all the PLO structure took decisions not to continue the cooperation, among other things, and Abbas insists on continuing the... Uh, and and he, he's proud of it, too, and, you know, uh, basically, he, he's a sellout, and that's what's happening uh, with the... Uh, peace process. And, uh, you know, I just like to uh, have a final quote about what he said. The significant number of independents, some of whom, like Shafiq al hout and Mahmoud Darwish, resigned in protest from the PLO, still have an important role to play, not simply 
uh, by the way, both of them passed away. Uh, uh, and uh, then they later formed the Mubadara, uh, the um, Edward Said form Al Mubadara with Mustafa Al Barghouti and Haider Abd al Shafi, who was the negotiator uh, in 91. So uh, they formed Al Mubadara, which is the uh, initiative, the Palestinian initiative. It's headed now by Mustafa Al Barghouti. He is only the one who's still living. But he, he urged people to uh, uh, be active and advocating specific alternation in the PLO structure. He was advocating that. And also this happened before 96, where the PLO uh, changed many uh, chapters in the charter. The most important one, dealing with Zionism as a settler colonialist movement, was one of the most important one. The second one, uh, giving up the armed struggle. As, as, uh, and he says, uh, Edward Said says, you know, you can't do that uh, while you're still under occupation. You're taking your right to fight back and to resist if, if you do that. And this, this is what happened, really, because uh, the PLO, it's the only liberation movement in the whole world, uh, and since 1996, that doesn't have a charter, basically. They said they're going to amend it later, but they never did. Till now, it still stand, uh, the, uh, the annulment stand, and uh, this is what happened. Just the, the I'm going to be a bit optimistic uh, uh, to say that we are in better situation now than ever as Palestinian struggle because of the movement in the region, whether in Iraq, Syria, Lebanon, uh, the Gaza Strip, the West Bank. Yesterday, I don't know if you hear, they forced the opening of a door to the Al-Aqsa Mosque uh, through popular uprising that was closed for 16 years. So this is an achievement, really, uh, for the Palestinian people. And, uh, you know, in Gaza, the struggle continues. And I think the Americans feeling that, and that's why they're moving out of Syria, and they're trying, the Iraq is trying to kick them out of uh, Iraq, including the parliament of Iraq and the, the, the prime minister of Iraq. So it looks good. The only thing I would like to add that we have a role here to play is to support the struggle of the Palestinian people by joining BDS work and actions. We have a committee here called uh, BDS Vancouver, Coast Salish Territory. If people would like to work with it, they are welcome. Actually, the, that, that's the aim of objective for us here in North America is to try to do concrete work, whether through BDS, whether through educational, whether through rallies. Thank you all.